Good morning or afternoon, depending on your time zone. My name is Janie Montblanc, and on behalf of the Great Basin Fire Science Exchange and our partners, I would like to welcome you to this webinar titled Targeted Grazing Applied to Reduce Fire Behavior Metrics and Wildfire Spread, presented by Ava Strand, University of Idaho, and Chris Schocksnyder, I mean, Oregon State University. This is our last webinar before the summer, but we'll be back in the fall with another series, so stay tuned through our newsletter and other communication channels. Before I introduce our presenters, I will go over some webinar details. If you have questions or comments for the speakers or me, please type them into the questions window of your control panel located at the top right of your screen at any time during the webinar. I will field your questions for the speakers after the presentation. I also want to let you know that whatever you do in your control panel does not affect the webinar presentation, so you're welcome to type a test message or test your audio at any time during the webinar. If you're having problems with your audio, please open your audio window and check your audio selections. Now I will introduce our presenters. Ava Strand is an associate professor in the Department of Forest, Rangeland, and Fire Sciences at the University of Idaho. Her interests center on ecology and geospatial applications in natural resources and fire science. Strand's research focuses on quantifying landscape change across spatial and temporal scales in rangelands and forests. Recent research projects include studies of the interactions between succession and disturbance events in aspen woodlands, plant community and fuels composition following wildfire and western ecosystems, and the impact of cattle grazing on fuels and fire behavior in sagebrush steppe. She teaches rangeland ecology and landscape ecology. Chris Schocksnyder grew up in central Washington and got his BS in animal science at Washington State University. He worked in the industry for a few years before earning his MS at the University of Idaho in 2016 in rangeland ecology and management, focusing his research on utilizing livestock to create and maintain fuel breaks. Chris is currently an assistant professor of practice for Oregon State University and the Livestock and Natural Resource Extension Educator for Umatilla and Morrow Counties. He is currently focusing on livestock handling, research and education, as well as rangeland health through monitoring and grazing management. Welcome Ava and Chris, and thanks for presenting today. Uh, thank, yeah, thank you. So uh, I will start off with a little bit of background on fire and sagebrush, and uh, then we will, then Chris will talk about the actual project that he did for his master's at the University of Idaho. Our other co-authors on this project is Scott Jensen and Karen Launchbaugh, and they are also online and will help us answer questions uh, at the end. So targeted grazing applied to reduce fire behavior metrics and wildfire spread. Uh, just to give a little bit of background, we all know that wildfires have been increasing uh, over the past few decades. Uh, we're not having, we're having about the same number of fires, but the area burned has increased, uh, meaning that we have more larger fires, and especially in uh, the sagebrush steppe areas of the Great Basin, the fire size have really increased within, I would say, the past decade or 15 years. This of course has led to uh, very much increasing uh, fire suppression costs. I just got this image downloaded from NIFSI and we're approaching uh, $3 billion annually for fire suppression costs. This is nationally, so that's not only the Great Basin. Uh, so just taking one step back, I always like to give a little bit of background on what, what is the role of fire in sagebrush. It's such a hot topic and, and widely um, kind of controversial these days. So what is or was the function of fire in sagebrush step? Well, one effect that fire has served or serves in succession is to maintain sagebrush as a cereal vegetation type. And that applies mostly to areas uh, where you have pinyon juniper or ponderosa pine or Douglas fir or other woody uh, 
uh, plant communities coming into the sagebrush. So, so fire there is beneficial to maintaining uh, the sagebrush steppe community. It also, fire also helps maintain cereal vegetation in within the sagebrush community. So maintaining that balance between grasslands, grasses, forbs, and the sagebrush. Uh, it diverts primary productivity from woody species to herbaceous. So uh, herbaceous species do benefit from fire in moderation. Uh, Fire can increase the forb component in the plant community, uh, and it, it contributes to est establishing recruitment of new uh, younger shrubs into the cohort of species. Contribute to nutrient cycling and also alters fuels. One way to reduce fuels is to uh, use fire. So that gives just a little background of what the role of fire is or was in sagebrush step. So what's going on now, one, uh, this map I try to show as often as I can. It was developed by Chuck McHugh uh, for the fire conference in Missoula a couple of years ago. And what he's showing in this map is the ratio of historical burn probability to the simulated contemporary burn probability. And what you can see in this map is these areas in green and blue are areas that actually still burn less than they did historically, while the areas in red and yellow are areas that burn more frequently or have a higher burn probability than they did historically. So we can see that those areas really have had a, a change in fire regimes. And if you did overlay this with a map of annual grasses, the red and yellow areas would coincide very well with, with those red and yellow. So annual grasses is a big reason why we see this change in fire regime in the Great Basin. So obviously, uh, fire is of great concern. Uh, wildfires are growing in the West. These altered fire regimes are caused by both climate change and introduced annual grasses. Uh, and in the sagebrush ecosystems, this has led to, in many places, a loss of sagebrush and that applies specifically to the Wyoming big sage areas, an increase in annual grasses. Although in the mountain big sagebrush, we might actually uh, still have less fire than we used to, which has led to woody encroachment in those areas. So some areas might still receive more fire than uh, in the past and some less. But what we're talking about here is mostly the areas that have uh, an increase in fire frequency and therefore the goal is to have fewer fires. So what do we need? Uh, probably most of you have seen the fire behavior, uh, fire behavior triangle or the fire triangle actually. So in order for something to burn, we need oxygen, heat and fuel and it's hard to control oxygen and heat. Uh, the main thing we can control in management is the fuel. And this leads us into the fire behavior, kind of another triangle. If you start from the bottom looking at what influences fire spread severity and intensity, we have weather, uh, for example, wind speed, direction, temperature, relative humidity, and all those components. The landscape features, slope aspect, uh, landscape heterogeneity, and so on, and fuels, the fuel characteristics, fuel amount, biomass composition, uh, continuity. And uh, cattle, of course, or grazing, any kind of, of uh, herbivore can't really do much about the weather or the landscape context, but where they can fit in is to alter biomass and, and fuels. Uh, and this, to, to try to change landscapes, we are currently implementing fire fuel breaks. So uh, th these fuel breaks can uh, reduce fire behavior and in some cases even stop fires. They do, they're often strategically placed across the landscape and they need to be there before the fire starts. It's when a fire comes, it's too late to try to implement one of these fuel breaks. And 
uh, they can be econ economical compared to the firefighting uh, for certain. So that leads us into what we're really going to focus on today, uh, that grazing has also been, cattle grazing has been uh, suggested as a way to impact these fuels in fuel breaks and other places. And these big questions really kind of came to the forefront after the large Murphy fire that occurred in, in about 10 years ago. So what effect can livestock grazing have on fuels and fire behavior? Uh, what are some reasons for the observed fire or burn severity contrast that we saw after the Murphy fire? And can, can vegetation patchiness affect fire spread? So let's switch over to Chris and have him tell us about the project that we designed in Reynolds Creek uh, a, a couple of years ago. Did that switch for everybody? Yeah. Okay, perfect. So um, I wanted to, to kind of highlight again that there when you need it, um, component on that last slide. Um, when we started working on this project, I got to work real closely with the um, BLM fuels manager um, there in Boise, Scott Okenson, and he really, he really likes the concept of grazing. You know, he's been around a little bit and he understands what's, or you know, what happens with a fire and he's seen, you know, where grazing can be beneficial and he wanted to see this through. But the biggest thing that he took to this is can we graze it at a time that's convenient for the producers and and be able to do that and also have it whenever those fires happen because we don't know when lightning's going to strike and we can't necessarily predict when that fire is going to start but so we need to have a fuel break in there that can be there when it's ready and when it's needed and so going back to the livestock grazing side of things um, currently livestock grazing is an underutilized tool uh, or is a utilized tool to get um, undesired vegetation and specifically that fine herbaceous material for cattle and that's what we looked at um, mostly here. So um, it's used um, periodically or can be used to reduce fire behavior metrics and that was shown in a couple of different studies that, that grazing can actually reduce flame height. Um, in one during the Murphy Complex fire, which down in southern Idaho and a little bit of Nevada burned a little over 600,000 acres, um, they had a panel put together that, that looked at this. And one of the things that they suggested was that grazing is an underutilized tool in fire management. But then also currently, even though there's fairly little scientific information um, about the use of livestock for fire breaks and for, for fire management, it is being used currently. Pretty much every year you'll be able to find newspaper articles. Um, one big one that you see a lot is in the chaparral down in California and goats being used down there to help control some of that chaparral around housing developments and different, um, different areas of that nature. But it's used pretty much anywhere throughout the US. Um, people want to use that livestock even though we don't have a lot of data that, that or scientific data that shows the benefits and how they can actually help with all of this. And so, there we go. So what does grazing do to affect fuel, fuel loads? Well, generally without grazing, you get accumulation of biomass and litter. And then when cattle can come in there, they can actually remove that herbaceous material and um, not have it there sitting dead and oxidized um, on the ground. And Kurt Davies, um, a researcher in Burns, Oregon, did a study that he found that that removal of um, the litter and, and previous year's biomass on top of the, of the perennial grasses can actually increase total fuel moisture on the site and reduce the time frame in which that that location is susceptible to fire because all of that dead material is removed which drastically reduces that fuel moisture leaving this living living tissue that has a higher moisture content and so being able to do some of these things we can actually mitigate that fire uh, or help mitigate some of those fire tendencies <clears throat> 
And so our main objectives that we're looking at is, is utilizing grazing to alter fuel, which then in turn alters fire. And so focused research again is needed. And this came from that Murphy complex fire um, study that they did and that we definitely need to realize where grazing can, can fit into the program of an integrated management plan for, for fire. And so we wanted to look specifically at um, to evaluate cattle's grazing effects on fuel and fire behavior metrics. And so we looked at two different seasons. So we looked at summer um, and then at fall or what we would also call peak biomass. So basically right as those plants start going to seed and little production is going or little biomass production is going to be produced afterwards. And then in the fall, which ours was specifically before that <clears throat> fire event or before our prescribed burns and that was grazed within two weeks of those prescribed burns so we use these to try to answer that question of there when you need them can you graze it at the onset or right at, right around the same time as the beginning of the fire season or do you have to graze it immediately before the fire event <clears throat> and then we graze at two utilization levels of a low and a moderate utilization um, to see um, the different effects on that and we'll talk about a little bit of residual biomass later on um, as we look through this study. So specifically on this study we were down in Reynolds Creek, Idaho um, which is just south of Marcin down in there in the Reynolds Creek watershed and we had two different sites. Um, we had an upper section and a lower section and the upper section was composed of mountain sage or mountain big sagebrush um, had higher annual precipitation, higher elevation, a shorter fire frequency because we were in that mountainous country of 20 to 50 years. Um, and this site specifically was a part of a prescribed burn in 2003. And so it had reduced shrub cover of 10 to 20 percent. Um, but because of that higher moisture content, it did have higher fuel loads um, total. And it was pretty, pretty good with a higher content of perennial grasses. And in our lower country, um, we consisted of Wyoming Big Sage, less precipitation, lower elevation, um, hotter, drier, um, as we would classically see. Um, historic fire frequency of 50 to 100 years, and the producers who own this property did not remember a time that it had burned, and so it had been at least probably 60 to 70 years since that place had burned. So we were either at the high end of of historic frequency or even beyond that. Higher shrub cover, cover of 25 to 66 percent and I will I will note that that 66 percent was a part of a thick patch of um, black sage so it was not very tall growing just low sagebrush. Um, considerably lower fuel loads and then a lot more annual grass invasion within this site. Our plot design, we looked at 10 different plots per block um, and we would prescribe burn um, half of those plots so that we could do some further studies to evaluate the differences of grazing and not grazing in these areas with that targeted grazing. Um, each, each, block, or each plot was 30 by 30 meters and we had no grazing, our two seasons of use, our peak biomass and our dormant season and our two utilization levels and basically a two by two factorial on those. And then we had the burn and non-burn. And then in between the two sites, um, we had a 30 meter pre-ignition zone because we were trying to evaluate whether or not grazing can be used as a fire break. We wanted to allow that fire to get to quote, quote, wildfire conditions um, before it hit our plots rather than trying to ignite on a grazed area where it's going to be more difficult to light. And so that pre-ignition zone was two years of no, of no grazing to allow that fuel to build up. Did some extensive monitoring on that, um, on these plots with two 30 meter transects placed at 10 and 20 meters. Um, we looked at shrub cover. And then we looked at biomass every three meters um, with quadrats and did some ocular estimations on those and then calibrated those estimations outside of our areas so that we didn't affect any of the fuel characteristics during the, um, during the study. And then grazing on these, we used 10 heifers that were selected by the local rancher. So one of the producers that owned the property allowed us to use some of his heifers and we used temporary fencing to contain them. 
and they were essentially placed in a plot for for one day and so we would we would do our um, monitoring and assess how much how much fuel or how much forage we had in each plot and then um, divide that out by how much we estimated those cows to eat in a day and then would allocate cows to the plots based on those numbers and then would visually assess that throughout the day and add or subtract cattle if we thought that was necessary to hit our target utilization goals. There we go. So the control burn was done in September of 2015 and we worked with BLM and the local um, RFPA there. And then the pre-ignition zone again, tried to mimic as, as much of real fire ignition or as real fire conditions as we could and then we measured rate of spread and flame length and we have a excellent little video here oops went too far let's try that again we have an excellent video in here that i don't know if you guys will be able to hear a little bit but this was one of the first plots that we did and um i would say that the blm was great to work with on this fire and this fire was done i believe it was three weeks after the soda fire which down there in oahe county burned almost 300,000 acres and so the blm was a little unsure about the fires that we were doing and a little worried that making sure that they did not get out of hand and so as they were lighting this um, as you can see right through here they lit across that pre-ignition zone and then um, this plot here in the forefront, I hope you can see my mouse on that, was the control plot that was ungrazed for two years. And then all of the plots down here were representative of the different grazing measurements. And we have, I believe there are 15 foot flame height poles in here that are alternating black and white. And there was four of them, two along each transect. So they're basically 10 meters in from both sides in a square so that we can try to estimate flame flame height as much as possible. And then we had observers that would watch each individual plot and they would assess the time in which the fire got to the plots. So right here on these first ones, we're gonna be pretty close to them. And then the time in which it left the plot and estimating flame height as, as often as they could. And each one of those observers just had a tape recorder, essentially an app on their phone, and they just talked the entire time so we could glean as much information as possible and observations that they had instead of trying to write things down and missing something during that time frame. So one thing to notice is that right about now is when those first plots were or that were ignited are actually coming into or that fire's coming into those plots. And the last plot that was, or the last area that was ignited was this control. And just watch how fast that control goes through that unburned vegetation compared to those gray areas. And we did have a little bit of a perimeter area that that they could burn this without really hitting that plot too fast but this fire comes in a little bit quicker so now look right about here those are about on those on that 10 meter to 20 meter mark and we've already had that fire completely go through our our control and even after this dies down a little bit some through the smoke if you're careful you can see that some of these fires are still going in here And then there was one of our super heavies that was in there to help us with this. And so before I get into this slide, like I was saying, um, our um, the BLM was excellent to work with um, just after the soda fire. So everybody was a little nervous about this getting out of pan and causing another hundred plus thousand acres of burning in, in Oahe County when they already had enough. And so, <clears throat> On this project, we were burning basically a 60 meter by 100 meter plot or area with that 30 meter wick and then our 30 meter plots. And we had 27 BLM fire personnel. We had two super heavies, two regular trucks, 
two dozers and one water tender. And we only burned one of these at a time and made sure that it was out and mopped up before we finished or before we moved on to the next one. So the BLM did an excellent job in making sure that nothing went anywhere past close to what we actually put or what we planned and, and did a great job in helping us with this. And I don't think we could have got those prescribed burns done without them, especially with that sort of fire. So now that I'm done giving a nice plug and kudos to the BLM, um, herbaceous biomass and cover. So what did the cattle do during this whole time frame? And as you can see on the bottom of this, let's see where, so we have our controls and then our series of grazed play or our grazed um, areas. And in mountain sagebrush or mountain big sagebrush, we, significantly reduce that biomass. And in the Wyoming sagebrush, there just wasn't much biomass to start with. So even when we reduced it, it was still fairly, or fairly similar. And in our litter cover areas, we greatly increased our litter in these areas um, in both the Wyoming and Big. And there are some studies out there that show that grazing, um, that grazing does reduce litter. And I believe that those are more of a long-term effect, not an immediately after effect. And so the litter that we are seeing is just uh, the nature of the beast of the cattle walking, milling around, laying down, um, stomping and trampling different plants. And that, that that type of litter could be reduced over time um, as they continue to graze more and more. But So that's why we see a little bit more of a litter cover increase on these is because that was sampled immediately after the cattle left that plot and we could see those effects of those animals knocking vegetation down to the ground, which is exactly what we want in a fire break. So grazing effects on fuel loads. Um, it reduced biomass and herbaceous vegetation. <clears throat> no difference um, in fuel loads between our, our peak biomass or our summer and our dormant season and fall grazing. <clears throat> so that means that our, our plots that we grazed Early on in the fire season, basically had that same that same effect of reduced herbaceous cover on them as the ones immediately before the fire. So that helps us answer that question of there when you need it. That Lance pounded in my head several times throughout the two years that I was there. And then we see a, a drastic um, conversion from standing biomass to compacted litter from those animals moving and milling around in those areas. And then um, for the short term, we had no effect on shrub cover, woody litter, or bare ground um, with the cattle in those areas. So what does that translate to on the fire side of things? Well, we found out that shrub cover is highly important when it comes to um, the effects of a fuel break and the success of a fuel break in these areas. And so, in this first section of the graph, this is sorted by shrub cover. So the higher the shrub cover is percentage wise of the, of the area, um, we just naturally had higher and higher flame lengths. And we got up to four meter flame heights. So we're looking, oops, let's go back. So, so pretty intense fire, fire characteristics in that high shrub cover. But in our mountainous sagebrush um, over here or over here, depending on how you look at that, we actually had an effect and we could reduce that flame height by reducing that herbaceous biomass. So over here on this slide or on this figure, herbaceous biomass on the bottom and flame height on the top, even with less herbaceous biomass overall than our mountain sagebrush, we still had higher flame lengths because of that. Um, because of that um, shrub cover, sorry. And then um, on the mountain sagebrush side of things where shrub cover wasn't as big of a factor, um, our herbaceous biomass actually had some prominence in reducing those flame heights. On rate of spread, things get a little bit more tricky, um, but as you go through herbaceous shrub cover, rate of spread really didn't change much and rate of spread is is not necessarily correlated directly to that herbaceous biomass, but is directed um, quite significantly to that shrub cover. So the higher shrub cover you have, the faster that fire moves through, and it can just transfer canopy, you know, canopy of one shrub to the next pretty stinking fast. 
So once again, here's another another good view of that, that shrub cover really matters. And so within this, if you look at this line right here is basically the four foot mark or 1.2 meter mark. And so for those of you that know firefighting capabilities, um, at one point or at four feet flame heights or, or below four feet flame heights, firefighters can come in there with hand tools and combat that fire head on but anything over and above that four foot flame height then they have to either have um, machinery with them or do indirect attacks on that fire and especially as you start getting into these these higher shrub component um, fires that we saw in the mountain or in the wyoming big sagebrush those are really what you could consider extreme fire behavior um, with that shrub density and those flame heights so how did grazing affect, uh, or what are the grazing effects on fire? So shrub cover is very important. Um, you have to, in a fire break situation, you have to control that shrub before you can even really be successful as a, as a maintained fire break. Um, so once that shrub cover is taken care of, grazing can be very beneficial in reducing the herbaceous biomass and changing the structure of it from standing biomass to compacted litter and help with the um, success of a fire break. And so, <clears throat> so yeah, and then grazing also changes that fire behavior when, especially when that herbaceous cover is fairly high. So when you have less shrub components and more thick shrub cover or thick herbaceous biomass, like we did see in the Wyoming big sagebrush, um, then we start seeing all of that. And so to kind of brush up on all of that, um, in this study, um, grazing at 50% utilization showed a 39% reduction in flame height and 23% reduction in rate of spread compared to no grazing. And this was on our plots that were less than 20% shrub cover. So when shrubs did not drive the fire behavior, we saw significant reductions in flame height and, and rate of spread. And so from our lack of differences in fuel characteristics um, between our summer and our fall grazing, um, we think that we can say that cattle can be utilized um, at the beginning of a fire season um, to create fire breaks and that that utilization can be seen in that fire break or on that landscape throughout the entire fire season and can be there when you need it, as Lance kept asking me. So, and then once again, um, as we've seen in, in some other in some other publications, that as shrub cover gets higher, so above 39%, the fire will carry through the canopy regardless of herbaceous biomass. And so, one thing um, with these that I do want to caution is um, with our with our structure and in the sites that we were on with the weather that we had, that 50% utilization looked like it worked fairly well. But depending on the site conditions and the herbaceous biomass that was there originally, utilization may have to be altered to meet a targeted residual um, biomass target that you want in that area. So after the soda fire, the BLM has put together a grazing for fire breaks area along what they call the Oahe front. So right there in between, you know, the Oahe's and a lot of that wild land and that urban interface. And in that plan, they want for, I think it's 200 feet along the roadway on both sides, they want a fuel break that has a stubble height of less than two inches. And so that utilization is going to be significantly higher than 50%. So don't necessarily get caught up on that utilization number, but it's more about what is left after the cattle leave that can be burnable. So. With that, um, going back into this, um, some of the things that Bunting um, in 1987 talked about was that for prescribed burn stuff, we might need to avoid grazing because grazing does have quite the effect. Um, and so as he talked about, below 600 pounds per acre of herbaceous biomass is difficult to carry a fire through. And so for our um, fire breaks, we may be looking at reducing that down to 600 or maybe even considerably lower than that 
of herbaceous biome or pounds per acre of herbaceous biomass. And so again, that utilization is relative to what's there to start with and then what your total goals are to actually commit. And then as Bunting found was that in a wildfire condition, fires can carry at um, anything greater than or less than 300 pounds um, of per acre of herbaceous biomass and anything greater than 30% shrub cover carries through the herbaceous load or carries at any herbaceous load. So for the wildfire conditions, we need to reduce it down below roughly about 300 pounds per acre of herbaceous biomass. And that would be the residual left after the cattle leave and then maintain, maintain lower, um, lower brush cover in order to make those successful. So to kind of give a little demonstrate or a little visual about what we're talking about with all of this is as weather severity goes from low to extreme and herbaceous load increases um, from bottom to top and sagebrush load increases from top to bottom up in this area where fire severity is low to moderate, herbaceous loads are high and shrub cover are low is where the influence of herbaceous fuels is on that fire. And this is also that same area where livestock can be successful. As we drop down in here and we increase that shrub component, shrubs are more influencing of that fire and livestock, especially cattle, are gonna be less effective. And then as we increase in severity coming this way, there's going to be a point in time where there's really not much we can do because that weather is perfectly primed for a wildfire and it's going to carry through just about anything that it gets or that it has an opportunity to. So what does this mean to land managers? Um, shrub cover must be addressed before grazing can be effective. So if you have strategic fire or if you have areas that that need to be um, implemented into for, for fire breaks, that shrub cover needs to be addressed in that localized area. Um, but these areas are also, also managed differently than an operational pasture management because our goal is fuel reduction, not necessarily livestock production. So using livestock in these areas as a targeted grazer to reduce fuel loads may hinder some livestock performance depending on how it's done and what those animals are expected to eat. And so that is going to have to be taken into consideration when, when people look into using livestock on these landscapes. Um, also with that, these have to be on a landscape level. And so just because one producer or one allot BLM allotment or Forest Service allotment has a great plan, if it's not connected to the rest of the landscape, it may not or it may not necessarily be successful because it may come through a different allotment or a different um, property owners and then still go around that fuel break and burn the areas that you're trying to protect. So then there's been a couple of studies about how to move animals into desired locations, um, especially down in um, New Mexico State with Derek Bailey. And they are finding that the combination of low stress livestock handling and some supplement blocks specifically for them was low, um, low moisture protein blocks can help concentrate those animals in these targeted areas. So if that 200 foot section is what needs to be implemented, such as on the Oahe front right now, then grazing in that area combined with some supplemental blocks because that cheat grass loses protein pretty stinking quick and it's more of a cheatgrass monoculture in that area and that can help keep those animals in a positive weight gain and a positive nutrient balance so that they can do the job that you're asking them to do so and then last but definitely not least is um, cooperation with fuel managers is key and so if you have public lands in your areas um, department of lands blm forest service cooperation between all properties across that landscape need to be interconnected on how fuel breaks can be implemented for that whole area. And so with that, I'd like to thank all of these people um, and organizations that helped us tremendously for what they have done to help make us or make this project a success. Um, and with all of that,
I'd like to ask if there's any questions. Great, thank you, Chris and Ava. All right, first question, could you summarize the effects of the prescribed grazing on fire behavior in the Wyoming Big Sagebrush study sites? <laughs> the fire effects. And so the fire effects on the big or on the Wyoming sagebrush sites were that we had high density of shrubs and very low density of herbaceous shrub cover. And so the livestock went in there and did their job, but the fire carried completely through the canopy of the of the shrub. And so we saw an increase um, flame heights and rate of spread compared to our mountain or compared to our mountain sagebrush sites, which had three to four times the herbaceous biomass, but considerably less shrub cover. Does that answer the question? I think so, but I'm, I am I was actually curious about this too. What about compared to the control sites? How is the flame height and spread rate of spread? Um, if you go, let's see if I can remember how to move this thing back. But if we go, we'll just jump back real quick. So right here is a pretty good one. Um, for all of that. So these are our controls. The solid black line is all of our control plots. And then the dashed line is our low utilization and the dotted line is our is our moderate utilization. And so right about this section right here is where we transfer from the Wyoming big or from the mountain big to the Wyoming big. And basically you can see that everything just kind of blends together. And so the the livestock grazing just is ineffective because there's too much shrub cover for that fire to carry through. Gotcha, thanks. Um, and I'm not sure if I mentioned it again, but for anyone who came in late, if you have a question, please open your questions window and type type in your question. Um, okay, thanks. The next question, if cattle um, increase uh, litter temporarily by trampling and laying on it, how, far um how many years into the future does it take for that litter to decrease that is actually a very good question um that i don't know if i karen you might be a little bit better to answer that one specifically um i know that as cattle are utilized on that landscape there's going to be less and less of that um, older decadent material and so then the cattle are going to better utilize the new lush green grass that's out there um, but Karen, do you want to step in and, and talk a little bit more about those interactions? Yeah, you bet, Chris, you about have it right, which is uh, oftentimes if you have really um, uncontrolled grazing or very heavy grazing at a wrong time of year, you'll have decreased biomass production, which would, of course, lead to less litter. But anytime you have utilization, if the animal doesn't use it, it will become litter. So it's kind of just simple math. In the case that you did, uh, Chris, you also mentioned that it's not just what is eaten, but it's what is what goes down onto the ground and is incorporated into the ground. Uh, so long term, uh, you might change um, some amount of litter, and then don't forget that um, grazing can also uh, increase the rate of, of shrubs on the community, which would decrease the amount of herbaceous literature. So kind of all three of those things are going on. Okay, great, thank you. Well, so far there have not been any further questions rolling in. Um, so I don't know if Karen or Scott had anything else that they wanted to add. Okay, can I just add one more thing that Chris mentioned, but I think Please. it's worth really, it, I, I think it's really worth thinking about and Chris and Ava both have been struggling with this as I have been, is um, you know we can use grazing a lot when we have mostly herbaceous biomass, but one of the challenges we have with increased shrub cover is less herbaceous biomass. Well, those two things are just intricately tied, uh, amount of herbaceous biomass and amount of shrubs. And uh, the, the role that grazing plays is, is really um, at that lower level of shrubs and where there's more herbaceous matter. So. I think Chris said it, I just wanted to re-emphasize that, you know, grazing plays a role uh, in certain conditions of the fire, but also when we have more herbaceous biomass. Great, thank you.
Um, we did have another question come in. Have you thought about the interactions with predators like wolves and or elk interactions with this management system? Are they even a factor or do you suspect populations increase, population increases to be influential? I know wolves have had influence on elk herbivory in Aspen and Yellowstone. That is a really good question. Um, before I tackle that one, I'll just go back to this slide um, <clears throat> to help visualize what Karen was talking about. And so when we come up here on this on this diagram where there's low fire severity, high herbaceous fuel loads, and low shrub fuel or shrub biomass, that is where the livestock are going to be most influential, especially cattle. And so as we get into higher shrub cover down in here, the fire is going to be influenced more by the shrub and it's going to be less influenced by that herbaceous. And so there might be opportunities kind of like I talked about earlier with the goats and the chaparral of utilizing a different type of grazer, but cattle specifically are not going to be very effective in this sagebrush or in this higher sagebrush areas, especially, you know, as we showed in ours with that mountain sagebrush at above 30%. Um, going back to that other one, which is, which is an interesting question. Um, I think when it comes to the implementation of fire breaks, I don't think that predators are necessarily going to be as big of an issue unless those predators are starting to prey on those animals without any human influence in that area. But like a good example on the project right now that the uh, um, Oahe, or the Boise BLM is working on on that Oahe front. It's a 200 foot fire break and in order to concentrate cattle and keep them on a 200 foot section, you know, that has a long strip or a 200 foot strip re is going to require almost continual um, human influence to guide and direct those cattle in that right direction. If the cattle are left where they're at, they kind of slowly disperse in a circular fashion rather than going necessarily on that one continuous path. And so I think, I don't think that we're going to see as much um, when it comes to implementing for fire breaks, as much um, predator um, issues in those, in those regards, because you're probably going to have a constant human presence in that area. Great, thank you. Um, Ava, did you have a comment? I thought I heard that maybe you said. Uh, I was just talking to April Hewlett is here in my room, so we were just kind of whispering, which we probably shouldn't do. But I was, uh, the question about Wyoming big sagebrush, I, I think it was a little unfortunate that we didn't also have a Wyoming big sagebrush plots that had low shrub cover, because I don't really think that the shrub, the sagebrush species is that important? Its height is going to be important, and possibly the mountain big could have been uh, having a higher fuel moisture, but I don't think it did because we did uh, measure the fuel moisture, and they were about the same in both plots. So, so the the information that we the results from mountain big sage could possibly also apply to Wyoming big sage. I think uh, looking at the relationship between shrub cover and herbaceous biomass. You were saying depending on shrub height. Is that what you were saying? Uh, cover the cover uh, the height cover? Reason would be about the same too for okay. the, the two sage. They're both big sagebrush species, and of course height is going to be important for the flame height as well. Mm -hmm. But uh, Wyoming big and mountain big, well, yeah, they they might be a little different too. Mm -hmm. So, but I think oh, it's yeah. it's really it's really that yeah. relationship between shrub cover or shrub biomass and herbaceous biomass. Uh, that would drive the fire behavior. Chris, did you? What do you think about that? Well, yeah, I was just going to say that 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 shrub species really isn't that big of a difference, you know, that I that I could see between those two subspecies, um, especially. And so, if we had if the roles were reversed and we had high shrub cover in our mountain sagebrush and low shrub cover in our Wyoming, I think our results would basically be the same. That in that low shrub cover areas livestock use, especially cattle, can be effective, but not necessarily in that higher shrub cover component. Yeah, I think that's right. Great, thank you.
Well, that looks like all of the questions. Can um, I add one thing? Yeah, please. So, so this is Scott. Uh, I just wanted to add here a, a couple of weeks ago, we there was a tour done across the Owyhee front trying to highlight the fuel breaks that uh, at least get folks out on the ground to be able to see the results of the this this spring has been the first full-blown year I guess you could say of of um, implementing the fuel breaks across the Owyhee front and so we were able to visit some areas where uh, BLM had, had contracted to have the brush mowed and so uh, where it was possible 200 foot 200 feet on either side of the roadway had been mowed um, basically that the purpose of that was just to reduce the shrub cover and then um, some of those areas had been um, targeted grazed some had just been grazed as part of a, a standard uh, grazing permit and then uh, we stopped in some other areas where there was very very low to to no shrub cover and um, and just a lot of fine fuels uh, mostly cheatgrass and medusa head but uh, where those had been been grazed uh, with that two inch or less than two inch target and so it was very interesting to see across that those various um, areas and treatments um, you know what had what's gone on and and uh, I think in some areas they were very successful in in being able to reduce the the fuel loads in those areas and others maybe the topography and and things cattle numbers weren't quite what they needed to be and and so a little more challenging but but it was a great first step to be able to to get this on the ground on a on a much larger scale and it will be uh, I think um, producers, uh, BLM, uh, all the folks involved have learned a lot and uh, will continue to refine that over the coming years. But um, it was a great first step and, and uh, really helpful to be able to be on the ground there and, and see some of those things. Hopefully we don't see a fire come through to try it out, but uh, I do think based on observations with Chris's research, I definitely think uh, quite a few of those areas that were treated this spring, um, if a fire were to come through there, we'd see a, a significant change in fire behavior and a, a greater ability for the firefighters to make some headway through that, that part of the county. Great, thank you for that. Well, if by chance a wildfire does sweep through, then um, we'd love to do a webinar about it. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to cross my fingers it doesn't happen but <laughs> yeah <laughs> sounds good sounds good <laughs> all right well um thank you so much all and uh, thank you for the audience for your participation we would greatly appreciate it if you would take our three question survey that will appear after the webinar has ended I will post the recording of this webinar on our Great Basin Fire Science YouTube channel this afternoon, and the link will be automatically sent to you through the GoToWebinar system tomorrow. If you have further questions regarding this or other webinars, please email or call me anytime. And again, thank you all for attending, and thank you so much, Ava and Chris, for presenting. You're very welcome, and thanks for having us. Great. All right. Well, have a great day, everyone.